Pilot. Oh, okay. Well, let me see what a Whoopi Pilot looks like. <gasps> Ooh, oh, boy. It looks good. Nice. Nice. Sorry, Rory. You don't get any Whoopi Piles, buddy. What's that? We'll eat, I'll eat mine right in front of Rory. Oh, yeah, boy, poor guy. After I finished blessing him, then Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence. His brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. His father, Isaac, asked him, Who are you? I am your son, <laughs> your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him. And indeed, he will be blessed. Does anybody get the same mental image as I do? When I read this, I think of him actually just, it says he trembled violently. I mean, I get these images, this old guy laying there and just, you know, like, uh, uh, who's the guy that was such a great actor at doing stuff like that as, um, uh, did Patton? Uh, George C. Scott, he could he could move his body in ways that was just fantastic, and some of these some of these old actors. But I imagine this guy was just, you know. And um, uh, anyway, go ahead. This next one brings up another great mental image for me. When Esau heard his father's words, yeah. he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, "Bless me, bless me too, my father." I almost cry when I read this. When I'm studying the Bible all by myself, and I read that, I think, what a sad, I mean, this guy, he might have been a bad guy, he might not have been the best guy in the world, but he was a human being like the rest of us, and when he heard this, he must have been first in anguish, and then obviously in wrath. We kind of go through those different stages, where he went through the anguish, and it is, it's so perfectly portrayed here that I can't imagine what it was like for him. I, I, I can't imagine. Uh, 35, go ahead. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. Okay, did he deceive him the first time? No. He's just upset about it to the point where he's even blinded himself. He gave up his birthright for a bowl of red lentil soup, okay? And, you know, it doesn't matter if he was hungry and Jacob took advantage of the situation. If he, he could have done anything else, he could have said, nah, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you that pile of rocks over there. And I'm sure Jacob would have taken it, but it was all part of the plan. But he didn't deceive him that first time. That was his own negligence. And that's confirmed in the book of Malachi and it's quoted in the New Testament. Esau I've hated, Jacob I have loved. And it explains why. Is because he, uh, uh, James, I think, says, or maybe Hebrews. James or Hebrews says, and he despised his birthright. Yeah. So, isn't it, isn't it, when we sin, isn't it uh, a natural part of our old disposition to blame someone else? Oh, yeah. Our, all you have to do is look at yeah. the Garden of Eden. Yeah. When uh, God asked him what they did, well, first well, the woman made me God do it. God forgiven him the woman. Right. And yeah. then the woman blamed the serpent, but... It's past the buck. The entire thing is past the buck. And that's what's going on. That's it. Yeah. They, and through the whole thing. You know, who didn't do that in the Bible? Who didn't do that? Joseph did. Joseph didn't. I was thinking of somebody else, but that's a good one. Who, who else didn't do that? He admitted his mistakes. Who? Peter. Well, Peter, it took him a while to come around to it. But yeah, and he... He, he, he was faced with the risen Christ. So, I mean, a little different. But uh, David... David was very good about acknowledging his own sins. You know, he tried to hide them, don't get me wrong. But when they were found out, it wasn't a name game with David. He wrote, the, we read the 51st Psalm last night, the most beautiful psalm of supplication and requesting forgiveness in the Bible. It is absolutely wonderful. David never tried to hide his faults. He simply got down on his knees and said, have mercy on me, O God. And he does it all the time. He, what, man, you read, you read the Psalms of David and I don't know how you can't think, I wish I was this guy, at least in my faith walk. Maybe not in the things he did, but boy, what I, the Davidic Psalms, I know why there are certain churches that that's all they sing, is because they are so stirring and so moving, and you can get so much out of the, the Psalms. But, 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 you know, God said the reason why he was picking, uh, take, uh, picking David instead of Saul is when he said he is a man after my own heart, he said, because he will obey me. So we all have the ability to be that's right. David, 
It's the obedience factor that will draw us near the Lord. And when we don't obey, to turn around and not point the fingers, but acknowledge our sin and move on. And that's what he did. And he committed a, a, adultery. He murdered somebody. He took an unauthorized census, which was a demonstration of pride. And yet 400 years after he died, he says, yet I will not destroy Jerusalem for the sake of my servant David. Misquote there, but that's what happened. 400 years later, he's still keeping his covenant of promise because of his servant David. All right, I, wherever we were, go ahead. I think it was 41. No, it's not. We haven't blessed him yet. Back in 37, 38. 37. Uh, 37, okay. <coughs> um, Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you and have made all his relatives his servants. And I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Okay, and he that, that continues to this day, just so you know. They are sustained with grain and new wine in the land of Israel. They're back into the covenant after their term of exile. And you go there and there's... I, I may, I have heard this is true. I can't say it truthfully because I've never done a study on it. But I've heard that Israel is the only land on earth that has all five grape growing regions. In other words, there are five climates that grapes grow in. Some are very wet, some are very, very dry. Israel has all five grape growing climates and it's the size of Rhode Island. In other words, they have the, the, the wettest areas and they have the driest areas and everything in between. They have all five types of grapes. And, um, and Rory may know about that because he's a venter. But um, uh, they, you go to Israel and they have got more Dis uh, not distilleries, wine, I guess wine is distilled also. They've got them everywhere. And everywhere you go, they've got their own brand of wine. I mean, if you were to save one bottle of every brand of wine that they have at the, you know, you stay at these, um, uh, what are they called? Um, what's the, the what? Hostels? Kibbutz. That's the hostel, but the kibbutz is what I was thinking of. The, each kibbutz makes their own brand of wine. And so, if you were to stay at all the kibbutzes as you traveled around Israel for two weeks, you'd have like 40 different bottles of wine you'd have to carry back. I mean, everybody makes wine over there. And uh, they've got grain, they've got all of this produce, and the, the blessing is still carrying on today. So, go to Israel if you get a chance, and just look at how faithful God has been to these promises that were made through the, the line that was chosen. Okay, I didn't mean to cut you off, but yes, I did. Go ahead, 40. Esau said to his father, you have only one blessing, my father. Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. His father Isaac answered him, Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword, and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Okay, and that did happen. That's not that a very good blessing. No, it's not a very good blessing, blessing at all. It's a matter of fact, it's kind of a, I'd probably rather not be blessed at all than have that, but you will be away from the fatness or the, the fertility of the earth. And they were. You go to where the mountains of Edom are, where Petra is in Jordan, and it's just, I'm telling you what, it is the pits. You know, they have like one nice hotel in all of Petra, Jordan, and it's, it's nicely, you know, nice inlaid stuff and mosaics and stuff, but I mean, that's it. That's the whole town. Everything else is just mud huts. And it's terrible. When you drive, you, you go out of Israel, go over, the, you know, through the, uh, the border crossing by the Red Sea, and you start going up around the other side of the Dead Sea through Jordan to get up to uh, where Petra is. And all of the houses are these mud houses. And what they do, I think, I think the idea is we're going to build a two-story house, but we have enough for a one-story house. This is what I think, because they, they put the rebar in, and the rebar is sitting up above the ha Did you go to Petra? No. No, okay. All of the houses, and I mean, this is what it would look like. It, it's the craziest looking thing in the world. You've got these houses, you know, this is a regular house, and here's the door, and here's a window, and a window, whatever. Window, I know too many windows. But, and so this would be your house. And, well, someday we're going to build a second story. So they leave all of the rebar sitting up, and it's... It looks so stupid. It, the whole country is like this. Everywhere you drive, there's houses that look like they will never be finished. And I don't know if that's why they have it there. Maybe it's to attract lightning or something. I have no idea why they did But I think that they are thinking, someday we're going to have children and we're going to build a second story. And instead they have 15 children and they all live in one room downstairs. I, I, whatever. But uh, they really do live away from the fatness of the earth. There's no doubt about it. And by your sword you shall live and your, you shall serve your brother. And that went on all the way through the Bible. You'll say Edom and, and uh, the land of Edom is serving their brother. And then they cast off his yoke. They fight away. And it's, so that's all been fulfilled in the Bible. 41. 
Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. No, really? <laughs> he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. you got a long time to wait, buddy. I, you know, he thinks dad's going to die soon, too. I mean, it's quite apparent from the entire text that it, they thought that Isaac was not long for the world, but he lasted quite a bit longer. Okay, go ahead, 42. When Rebecca was told that her brother that her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. Okay, before you go on, remember Laban is the one that saw the gold that was given to Rebecca when she was young. Put the gold thing in her, remember Ahab the Arab? Bone in her nose, ho, ho. Anyway, so um, uh, he puts the thing in her, gives him all of this wealth, and now he is, she is sending him back up there. So that's kind of setting the stage again. Once again, you can kind of look forward and see what's about to happen. But uh, go ahead. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, yeah, that's going to happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? And she never did send word for him, just so you know. So that was unfulfilled promise on her part. All right, 46. Then Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. Why did she say that? So that he would send them to the Right. Mm -hmm. she, she, she's already told him, I want you to go, but this is her way of convincing her husband who probably knew what went on but didn't know that, that, that all the details he's just laying there in bed and people are tending to him when necessary but uh, yeah this is her way of getting him to say alright we're going to send him away from here uh, whether he knew or not I have no idea but this is her way of doing this by saying I just don't the what? oh yeah yeah absolutely she's, but she's uh, I don't want him to marry one of these and uh, uh, okay 28 and we got yeah we got 28 minutes so that's that's great. 28 to 28. Go ahead. You want me to I, if you want, whatever. If anybody else wants to start reading, whatever. I'm just easy as pie. So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him and commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of your mother's father, Bethuel. Take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Okay, so he knows that Laban is Rebekah's sister. And he's old enough by now to have had children. So he says, go there and get daughters from her. In other words, marry your cousin. Mm -hmm. All right. And once again, the same names that were mentioned way back there, Bethuel, Laban, all of these people are being brought back into the picture. So a little divergence and then back. And a little different. And that's the way this whole account goes. Uh, where are we? Three. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham, so that you may take the possession of the land where you now live, as an alien, the land God gave to Abraham. Okay, as an alien, or in which you were a stranger. Why, why did he add that in? What did God say to Abraham about the land they were in? You will remain strangers and aliens, 400 years you will be persecuted by a nation. Not In other words, this isn't your land. I haven't given it to you specifically yet. It's your land, but not actually. It's for your you and your descendants after you, but you are still an alien here. And this is the same terminology of being an alien. I think it's a Peter that says we are aliens. Of, is it Peter? We're pilgrims and aliens in the land in which we live. And so it's a picture of us. We're living in the world, but we're not a part of the world. And that's what Isaac is living in the land of Canaan, but he is not part of the people of Canaan, unlike Esau, who is joined to them through marriage and everything else. And so if you can see what I'm talking about is this is a actual, uh, uh, an earthly picture of what we are supposed to be spiritually. We're living in this world, but we are not joined to the people of this world. We are aliens, uh, foreigners, and sojourners. I'm trying to think of where in the Bible that's mentioned. It's maybe Hebrews, maybe Peter. I, I ought to know that right off the top of my head, and for some reason I'm having a real brain uh, dump right now. But anyway, go ahead. 